Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a, a, quite a pleasure for me to welcome uh, Libby Homan from Mass General and Harvard. Um, I'm sorry to say, sort of, that uh, we've known each other since way back in 1990 when we were both first year fellows at MGH. She was an IV fellow, I was a GI fellow. We happened to be on the transplant service at that time, and I just remember sitting in the back of the room, passing snide comments back about the transplant surgeons of that time, and probably nothing has changed. Um, Libby went to uh, Williams, where she had her undergraduate degree in Harvard Medical School, and then trained at uh, Beth Israel. I don't think it was Deaconess Beth Israel at that point. It was just Beth Israel. And then uh, the rest of her career has been at Mass General. She's an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, uh, but also has a huge role as the uh, director of the Partners IRB, which is a massive job. She's the physician director and um, the chair of the whole thing, which is comprised of multiple, I don't know how many, there are 10 mini IRBs, a uh, huge job. And I've always thought that uh, Libby should be kind of an honorary gastroenterologist, but she's always been interested in enteric pathogens and actually has done uh, very creative things with um, salmonella vaccines and listeria vaccination, and more recently, uh, FMT has been her, her topic. And so I, I think she's one of the few ID specialists in the country who really has delved deeply into FMT. So it's uh, really a pleasure to have you here in New York. Thanks for visiting us. Great to be here. It's really exciting to be an honorary gastroenterologist because you guys are a lot more fun than ID. <laughs> you have movies, you have arguments, it's good stuff. So I'm from Boston for a long time. Uh, you know, those of us in Boston are a little anxious about coming to New York. There's a little competition there. We're a little stodgier in Boston, but you know, we have a cute dog. You guys don't have a dog. There's no New York Terrier. So. Um, I can say those things about Boston because I'm not really a native. I'm actually from Minnesota. This is a picture of my dad actually coming to uh, the U.S. for the first time. He immigrated after the war. Not uh, an easy thing to do. And uh, kind of the, one of the things that uh, he always taught me was, Work harder and don't make a fuss. That's kind of what people in Minnesota say. So, a couple disclosures. I'm a consultant for Ceres uh, in Cambridge. Uh, I am going to discuss off-label uses of stool. And uh, I'm not a microbiome person. I really uh, think this is a great field. I wish I were young enough and smart enough to be in it. So. Um, I will have some big, simple pictures. So I'll start with a case. 65-year-old man uh, was working for the state of Massachusetts, incidentally found to be hep C positive um, by the mandated screening these days and somehow got a chest x-ray related to that. And a smart have lung cancer, which was taken out, and then he got pneumonia, and then he got C. diff. And then he got all those drugs you can see up there. And then he fell running to the bathroom because of his C. diff and he fractured ribs. And he got more pneumonia and more C. diff. And, you know, the ship is sinking here. The poor guy can't work anymore, finally gets referred for FMT. So we'll come back to what happened to him towards the end of the talk. So FMT, it's microbiota. I always tell patients they want to call it the fecal implant. And I always say, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, and I don't get paid like one, unfortunately. So, you know, this is what it is, um, why we think it works. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Many people used family members in the old days, but I think virtually everybody has transitioned to uh, young, healthy screen donors, and that's what we do. And we pretty much basically approach um, that Alex Koritz uh, has recommended. So these are all the, the tests that we do on our donors. Um, I always tell the patients, they're more carefully screened than blood donors, and that is something that patients can, can understand, and they are indeed. Um, we have recently added uh, a lot more screening, including VRE, MRSA, carbapenemase-resistant organisms, which are increasingly coming into the US from travelers and, and others. 
we even do CMV and EBV viral loads because we'll treat pretty much anyway. This is a really stringent uh, screening process and only about one in four who actually pass the phone screen um, will qualify. And as you probably know, there's FDA uh, discretion for single patient, uh, patient uses, but if you're a bank or a distributor of stool, you do need to go to the FDA. Um, this is the consensus for FMT for C. diff, pretty much three episodes or two hospitalizations, I think, are accepted reasons um, to do this. Some people think you should fail the vancomycin taper. Um, we do not require that. And generally, cure is considered no relapse at, at eight weeks. I do not give people FMT while they're getting antibiotics for endocarditis or osteomyelitis or something. Um, and there are increasingly data that suggest if you're giving other antibiotics, fidaxomycin might be a better choice. So a, a little um, digression here to talk about antibiotics. Patients and doctors often ask me, how many people are gonna fail the vancomycin taper? And th there is no real good data out there about this. Um, the original data comes from um, this paper I've, I've referenced there in, in gastroenterology in 2002, and you can see these are really small numbers of, of patients in each of these groups um, in support of the taper, which is kind of a standard thing that we do. If you dig into this, it, it's hard to find data. Um, there's some, some newer stuff uh, that shows uh, that these series where FMT is tried, a lot of the people have failed. Um, people, you know, up to 62% uh, of people in the uh, famous uh, Van Nude study. This is an interesting paper in an obscure journal in the infectious disease literature, Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. And I found this really enlightening. This shows you what, be, what happens when you give people vancomycin. So this was an experiment of nature, so to speak. They took rheumatoid arthritis people with a new diagnosis with the idea that the microbiome is in part responsible to RA. They treated people with um, Vanco followed by methotrexate or just Vanco alone. I'm not entirely sure why you would do that, but they did. And this is the microbiome data for, from this. And you can see this, uh, I'm a little, oh yeah, I do have a pointer here. Um, this astonishing decrement in um, bacteroidetes here, um, in this guy, you know, it just plummets after vancomycin, which has no activity against those organisms. Really kind of astonishing. Proteobacteria, these bad things, salmonella is in this class, Klebsiella goes up after vancomycin. Kind of amazing. And this is the same study, time to recovery. How long does it take to go back to normal? And this is over 22 weeks. And you can point, it's pretty variable. Oops. I uh, got my little thing there but beforehand, but this is over 22 weeks. This person is recovering, but this person over here had almost no recovery. You know, astonishing. Um, and this shows how really toxic this can be to the microbiome, and it leads to this concept that's been promulgated by Eric Pamer at MSK of microbial domination. When you get uh, the intestinal flora taken over by one bug, and some of the worst bugs here are VRE or Pseudomonas. So this is, is a bad thing and something infectious disease people are quite interested in. Did the methotrexate happen? Um, no, not really. It didn't do much um, compared to that. So um, another thing that um, I was talking with Ari about last night, um, this is something that I think people are increasingly doing instead of a vanco taper, uh, a deficit taper, if you can get this drug. Um, it is very expensive. And what this um, study, which is only an abstract form in Europe, was people who had a first or second episode and um, basically, uh, oh gosh, I'm not working here. I gotta go backwards. Um, I'll proceed. Um, does that go, does that yeah. doesn't go back? Yes. Uh, on, 
computer idiot. I can actually, yeah. Oh, there you go. There we are. So um, significantly less relapse um, when you do this. And cleverly, the dosing regimen here is such that it's the same amount of pills as the 10-day regimen. So they give it BID for five days, followed by every third day with the remainder of people at a prescription. So I, I thought this was kind of a, a clever thing to do and something I might try if I could ever get this drug, which I can't. Um, so back to FMT, uh, what are the routes of delivery? Of course, you all know this. Um, many different ways you can do this. Um, at MGH, we have kind of piloted this idea of capsule-based FMT. Um, I think there's a pretty wide agreement that if you can do it by colonoscopy, that is the best way to do it. Um, if you can get it into the uh, ascending colon. I personally think the least appealing way to do this is by enema for a variety of reasons. GI doctors don't like it because it sucks up a place where they could be doing other more important procedures and ID doctors don't like it because there's no way we can give enemas in our clinics. <laughs> and it ain't happening. Um, so it's useful to go back to this now kind of ancient history study, um, the big one in the New England Journal that I'm sure you're all familiar with. But there are some salient points in it when you go back and, and look at it carefully. And a couple of them, here's the three arms that they used. Um, it's important to, to think about some of these things for practice. In their, their, one of their active arms, they actually only gave five days of Vanco. I think most of us use a lot more than that when we're treating a target episode, but um, it did work pretty well. Um, and they did uh, pilot uh, these different uh, approaches. Um, Importantly, and this is, I think, one of the big issues in C. diff uh, today, it's important to note that these were people who were toxin positive. So this is the real deal. You know, this isn't just PCR positive. Um, this is bona fide uh, C. diff colitis. And increasingly in infectious disease, certainly, we're appreciating that a lot of people are just shedding C. diff by PCR, and it really doesn't mean much. Um, they had astonishingly um, good data. Uh, people who got one dose uh, and then failed and got a second one got up to 94%, as you probably recall. And even the control patients did well um, when they were subsequently treated. Another study that I'm sure you're familiar with out of uh, New York and Rhode Island, um, this was the blinded study where they used people's own stool versus a uh, donor stool, and it was blinded, um, really a, a well-done study. Importantly, though, PCR was used primarily to diagnose here, so how many of these people uh, truly had active colitis at the time they were assigned. And again, at the ID meetings this year, this was a huge debate uh, among experts. Should we use PCR or toxin and the pros and cons of how to do that? Most labs have switched exclusively to toxin, unfortunately, in my opinion. Um, so here's the data from that study. Um, and as you can see, the, the New York people, there was no difference between um, uh, own stool or donor stool. Bigger difference, more um, consistent with what we would consider kind of the standard results in Rhode Island. And then overall, it sort of, you know, evens out. So uh, a couple important caveats about this study. This was a lot younger and healthier crowd that most of us doing FMT actually see, did confirm efficacy overall. And it reminds us how powerful placebos can be, particularly when we're talking about um, GI complaints. And of course, people have talked about the celebrity doctor. You know, people were waiting six months to see Larry Brandt. And basically, they resolved their problem over that time as they tapered down on vancomycin. And it also highlights you know, who does really need this 
and that microbiomes do change over time, even if you're poisoning them with vancomycin. Um, looking at the microbes in this study is fascinating, although the data are a little incomplete. And um, you can see there's not actually a um, humongous difference between those who got the self stool versus the donor stool when you kind of try to delve into the microbiome. And the red and orange bars there are these proteobacteria, um, which are kind of some bad things here. And just to translate the infectious disease, the gamma ones are E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, Pseudomonas, Yersinia, you know, you don't want to have any of those in your GI tract. And then the beta are similarly not such great things. So these are some of the, uh, the bacteria that are moving out when you, when you do FMT. But interestingly, it's not hugely different between the donor and the uh, own stool. So we have a lot more work to do, I think, to really understand what this means. This study was a real downer, um, in my opinion. This is one of the few studies that actually compared FMT to vancomycin taper. And uh, this is what they did. People had to have at least two episodes. 80% um, of them had failed prior vanco taper. So that's a really hard-bitten, terrible crew. Um, and this is what they assigned them to. FMT by enema, again, the worst route, in my opinion. Um, so perhaps not the greatest. And uh, vanco taper for four weeks, that's, that's listed there for you. And here's the results of this study. It was really kind of a bummer. Um, this is actually recurrence on the y-axis there. So people are relapsing as you go up. And you can see that fecal transplant appears far worse than vancomycin taper. Um, caveats on this study and why I think this doesn't reflect reality, these were really tough cases, bad patients. Um, the groups were pretty well balanced. I feel these are atypical results. Um, again, enemas are not very good, hard to do technically. You lose a lot of the stuff. And probably most importantly, these people were again diagnosed primarily with PCR. And when they were re-diagnosed, it was very quickly after stopping whatever the treatment was. So this is days down here. So they're retested within like three days in most instances. When I do FMT, I do my darndest to not have anybody come back in to see me for at least 10 days. And I certainly uh, try to jolly them along and don't get any testing within three days of their FMT because it's going to be positive in almost everybody if you do that, even if they're going to do well. I've had patients six months after FMT who tell me, I went back to my yoga classes. I'm hiking the you know, Appalachian Trail. And if you can get a lab to test a form stool, sometimes it's still positive. So I think this is really an important point, not appreciated by many primary care doctors who just want to order a test and act on it. This is yet another, even more interesting study um, looking at putting in the fecal soup and not the bacteria. So I'm sure you saw this when it was in the GI literature they did on the bacteria out of suspended stool, and then they filtered out the remaining bacteria and just used the supernatant. So these were, again, pretty sick people with multiple prior episodes. One had actually had a prior FMT even, and they put in a liter of lavage fluid, and then uh, a little bit later, this 500 milliliters of filtrate. All but one of them utilized a family donor, which, again, we almost never do. Um, they say that the um, microbiomes changed. I don't think these are tremendously dramatic changes, but um, they are there. Some people don't change a lot. And you've got to ask, what is responsible for this, um, for these people improving? And remember, all the other stuff that comes along um, in stool, and I've listed just 
some of the things for you here. They did try to look at the proteins and other features, the viruses that came along and see um, if there was any kind of smoking gun that might have contributed to the improvement in all five of these people, um, and they didn't find anything. Um, but uh, here, and here's some microbiome data from this. Interestingly, this was the um, husband-wife pair over here, and this person had previously gotten an FMT from their spouse, and you can see they look almost identical. Um, you know, kind of interesting. Um, this was a brother-sister pair, and the donor and a patient are are significantly different and did seem to um, come closer together as time went on. So what accounts for this, and what accounts for the improvement? I think a lot more work um, needs to be done here, and it's going to be complicated. Again, from an infectious disease perspective, I think um, it's important to remember the other stuff beyond bacteria. And this is a recent paper that talks about phages. And there are C. diff-specific phages. And it's not ridiculous to believe that this might be an important um, contributor here. This was a study where somebody was trying to develop C. diff phages for targeted release in the colon. And it seemed to work in an animal model anyway, based upon pH and this sort of um, polymer um, little uh, microspheres that they managed to pack these phages into. So another interesting approach for C. diff. So moving on to, to our series at, at um, MGH, uh, I've been doing this since about 2012, just as a lark, because one of the fellows said, you know, why don't we do this at MGH? We have to refer people to Tufts. That is so embarrassing. <laughs> so I said, well, I could do this. I have a lab, you know, so we kind of got into this. We um, initially showed that, that there wasn't much difference when we um, administered a frozen inoculum uh, by the upper root versus the lower root. And we did that because we are interested in going on and making frozen capsules. And so that's what we did. Um, we've now treated 318 patients with FMT capsules. Um, this is real world data. If you can swallow a pill and you have recurrent C. diff, I will treat you. And I've treated people from ages 7 to 99 with these capsules. Only one patient barfed them up. He was a patient with um, brain tumors who was barfing up all of his other meds. Fortunately, he did that when they were still intact from his stomach, and he didn't have any sequela from that. Um, he actually took the second dose and was cured, so that was, that was kind of cool. I have treated a guy who was 99 years old, and he wants to get to 100 because his buddies at the VFW have a really big birthday party planned. <laughs> I think it's going to involve some naked women. <laughs> um, so our, our approach is 15 capsules on each of two successive days. And we do this now as build care. People need to be NPO for one hour before and one hour after. Um, so it's pretty simple. We stop vancomycin uh, usually 48 hours before. But if they're really sick or really worried, we'll do it 24 hours. Um, so some of the logistics of how we do this, we basically blenderize it. We sieve it with metal sieves. Um, we um, spin down the bacteria. So we're aspirating the supernatant. We're not including that um, in the stuff. We then resuspend in a concentrated form into these capsigel capsules, which are somewhat acid resistant. So they don't open in the stomach. They open in a more um, alkaline environment. Um, we are trying to get to a more um, streamlined methodology for doing this. And these are some uh, plastic uh, nylon sieves that would be pretty disposable for any of the women in the audience. These are actually embroidery hoops that my lab tech purchased at Michael's Arts and Crafts because it's hard to find these things. We thought this was going to be the answer, and we put this in the autoclave, and they just blew up. So. <laughs> How to find another another way to do that? It looked so good, and then you know, oh, it was just disappointing. So we can do this for about 500 
dollars a dose. Um, our cost basis includes finding the donors on Craigslist, screening them extensively, um, all those labs I mentioned. We pay the donors about 500 bucks if they give us 10 samples. Um, there's a lot of paperwork and record keeping, lab tech time, um, and, and that sort of thing. I saw a great, I reviewed a great paper um, recently that, that unfortunately didn't get published because the other ID reviewer had too many OCD gene copies and tortured these poor people. But they looked at um, the difference in screening tests at various FMT programs, the costs, and so on. And they actually had 40 to 1 of people who actually took part in some component of screening and they got down to one donor but it was kind of funny because it was from Canada and many of the people actually left Canada in the middle of the winter to go to some tropical climb so then they didn't qualify anymore so we don't have such a big problem here in the US because people don't travel that much um, so these are our capsules um, we've do, been doing this for quite a while now we have placebo capsules. They are indistinguishable. Um, the placebos contain uh, chocolate and gelatin, and I can't tell them apart. They're really um, pretty good. Uh, the only reason, <laughs> the only reason we have to uh, use that is because these translucent capsules are far cheaper than ones that are opaque. So that's why we use these ones. So these are our results, and 282 have reached the eight-week time point. With the initial dose, we have about an 83% cure rate. Um, if people fail, we give them another short course of ANCO, and we'll offer them another 30 capsules, and then we can get up to 93%, which approaches what you can get with colonoscopic delivery. Um, once we get somebody in our clutches, we don't let them go, so if they will take a third dose, we can get even a little higher. The people who fail, who are in the little um, dotted uh, thing there, are people who don't want to do it, go on suppressive vanco, or um, die, because it's a pretty sick elderly population. So this is our AEs over time, and... Um, you know, we have uh, about a 9% death rate over six months because these people are old and sick and have so many other medical problems. We've had no deaths related or believed related to FMT. I will point out that this patient population in some large studies, in fact, one recent one down to the VA, have an 11% death rate over a month sometimes. So these are excellent data. You know, people who are this sick are sick, okay? Um, we've also had two cases of um, new IBD in patients um, that weren't appreciated to have it. One was suspected of possibly, and the other one was totally um, de novo. Um, so I do tell people about that. I have a line in our consent form um, about that, and I personally try not to treat the IBD patients. I prefer to send them to our GI colleagues because if something does go bad, they're much better equipped to, to deal with um, that. Special populations, um, I've done this in pretty much everybody at this point who can swallow pills um, listed over there. Sometimes people worry about neutropenia. There was a study this summer in um, clinical infectious disease uh, that uh, was looking at microbial restoration after bone marrow transplant, and 40% um, of their patients were neutropenic, and they still did it, and they all did fine. I've treated about uh, 25 patients post bone marrow transplant who've not been neutropenic who all uh, did well. Um, pregnancy, there is a case report in a pregnant woman at 28 weeks. I haven't undertaken that yet, haven't actually been asked. I've treated a few postpartum um, women, but I'm kind of worried about, you know, everything we're learning about the microbiome in babies, and I'm not sure I want to take on the medical legal hassle um, in a pregnant woman. I'd probably keep her on suppressive vanco and do it postpartum. So what about patients with IBD? Um, this is indeed carrying coals to Newcastle to talk about inflammatory bowel disease, and I do it with some trepidation. 
Um, but there are a couple um, recent studies, this one by Monica Fisher, um, and they had a 12% uh, a serious um, adverse event rate in a pretty good cohort of 67 patients. Um, interestingly, about 18% of their patients were deemed worse at the 12-week time point in terms of um, their inflammatory bowel disease symptoms. And um, so, so this is a pretty good uh, study in, the, in that regard. Um, this is a smaller study from my colleagues at, at MGH, Hamid Khalili, who uh, wrote this up with us. These were all capsule-treated uh, patients. And you can see we've got a little bit worse number here. 54% um, of the patients needed some treatment escalation after FMT. Um, that's a little sobering. He also had three cases of people who had fistulas or abscesses in the perirectal area. Um, this was mostly fairly late after FMT in the kind of six months to one year time point. Some of you may have seen, I actually forwarded a question to the FMT listserv about whether anybody else had observed this and nobody else um, had. People weren't like jumping to respond to this. Oh yeah, we've had some problems, but um, a number of big groups uh, did respond and said they hadn't seen this. So I'm not sure if this is just our site. Um, the other thing is these were fairly late and kind of six months is the time frame at which people tend to stop following patients because that's the time frame that the FDA mandates if you're doing it under IND. So this may be a late complication worth um, thinking about. Um, when I work with Hamed, um, he typically is most interested in treating people when they're in a quiescent um, phase with their IBD. And I have suggested that perhaps this might be a place where we should try bezlotoximab, the new antibody. You know, if, some, if you're worried about uh, flaring a person, maybe that's something you should try first instead of um, <coughs> FMT for recurrent C. diff. So probably more to come. So a little bit about the microbiome. Why does this work? Um, because we do improve diversity, and these are a couple of, um, or these are analyses from, from some of our patients, and you can see that post-FMT people do um, approach the diversity of donors. And uh, we studied this a little bit further in a cohort of patients um, where we were able to have one donor that gave stuff to, to a bunch of patients. So it was kind of a nice, uh, again, experiment of nature. This was done by Eric Alm at um, MIT. And so they looked at the diversity of uh, a reasonable number of donor organisms here. The darker the color, the greater percentage of, of organisms in the uh, stool. And um, as you can see, Looking at the 15 patients, there's only a small number of organisms that are kind of durably engrafting in all recipients. And it's not necessarily those that are present at the highest amount. So that guy, there's a lot of it there, but it doesn't stick. You know? So kind of an interesting um, observation there. Um, when you delve further into this with specific microbes, um, Fecalobacter prausnitzii, kind of one of those bugs that, that seems to be a good one. Um, here you can see that pre-FMT, this, this recipient had zero of this organism. The donor had four different kinds. And after FMT, time one, two, and three, which is about uh, six months, uh, the recipient basically looked just like the donor, and they stayed that way. So that was kind of interesting. But then here's a totally different one. Um, different donor, uh, different recipient. Again, the recipient had zero of this at the get-go. And over time, you can see it changes a lot. And at the end, it really doesn't look very much like the donor. So um, again, this highlights the fact that the microbiome is changing over time. And 
you know, things come in and things go out, and they're, they're, it's not static, okay? Particularly when you get down to, to um, species level and looking in a very fine manner at specific microbes. Um, this is another paper that, that we did with some of our, our uh, data from our, our series with Scott Weiss um, and colleagues at the Channing Labs in Boston. And this mathematics is so far over my head. I read the paper five times and I still couldn't hardly understand it. But um, what they were able to show is there's a concept that they call a dissimilarity overlap curve. Uh, and this is carefully analyzing the populations of bacteria and the way they interact. So it's based on population science and how ecological systems evolve over time. And what they were able to show was that healthy microbiomes are basically kind of universal and they have a very a much more similar community structure than a dissimilar one. So it's not that everybody's unique and has their own special thing. It's more like everybody who's healthy is sort of the same, at least in a community structure. So for C. diff, I think it's widely accepted that we don't need a special microbiome. We just need a healthy, good one. And um, this is yet to be answered for other illnesses and, and trying to restore people back um, to correct an imbalance. But um, again, clearly we have a lot more to learn about this community structure. This is just another fun picture um, that more graphically shows you one of our healthy donors over time. This is donor number 29. He's a computer nerd that works at the MGH. He's one of our favorites. And you can see he, he you know, is pretty stable over time. Um, I consider this stable, but I showed this to one of my GI fellows who was working with me on a project, and she's like, oh my God, this is so different. You know, how are we gonna use this guy? I'm like, no, yeah, you can use this guy, this is pretty good. Um, and again, you can see he has some of these happy bugs like Glaudia, Fecalobacterium, Roseburia, which have been found in a variety of studies to be some you know, happy things that we should want to have in our intestines. Um, and this just kind of drills a little further into this. Um, these are a sector series of patients who got FMT for recurrent C. diff after bone marrow transplants. So, you know, pretty sick people with pretty abnormal microbiomes. And um, this is looking at how Roseburia, one particular organism, changes over time. So again, the donor organism is here, or the donor set of bacteria. And then the color codes are whether you can definitely say the bug came from the donor, came from, didn't come from the donor, or you can't really be sure. Um, and you can see they change over time. And at 408 days when we got a sample, this person was sailing along, um, it's totally different. So the Roseburia have nothing to do anymore with the donor. Um, and this is even the donor over time, the guy that I just showed you. So this is the reference sample, and when you do this analysis, um, you know, it's a little more stable, but it, it shows that we are all changing over time. Uh, things are coming in and going out. Um, so there those things are, and I, I thought I'd give you a couple interesting points about these common supplements, um, which are coming into the GI tract. In many of our patients, that's a classic recurrent C. diff person right there. It's an older woman. Um, you can see she's got a little kyphosis there. She's certainly taking Kalim. Um, she may have purchased this one because it says right here, it's good for your immune system, right? And, you know, God forbid she's actually taking this one, which is, is probably the kiss of death. I'll show you why I say that. Um, so, this is a recent study that um, looked at the effect of calcium on germination of C. diff spores. So this is three different measures of C. diff sporulation in an animal model. And you can see here that torocolate, a bile salt, and calcium are basically synergistically acting in causing C. diff spores to germinate. They act pretty impressive, you know, either here 
And when you put them both in there, it's like C. diff spores just go to town, you know? So this is kind of an interesting thought about um, all the old women who are taking calcium supplements for their osteoporosis. Makes me wonder whether they should have a holiday from this as well as the omeprazole that all of them are on, which is also messing up um, calcium. And then you add vitamin D into the mix too, you know. Um, vitamin D deficiency may allow you to have even more calcium intraluminally. It, um, if you don't have enough, it doesn't get absorbed. So it's kind of interesting to think how this commonly used supplement could be interacting. Um, similarly, zinc, this is an interesting study um, in Nature recently that showed in animal models that by adding zinc, you can potentiate the number of uh, C. diff in the stool. So this is the control here. The red ones are when you add zinc. This is amazing. This is a log scale, 10 to the 2 up to 10 to the 8. I mean, zinc, it's just making C. diff go wild. And they could show um, a difference in the cecal histology spores as well in these animals. So uh, I tell people who come to see me, let's take a calcium holiday, don't take any zinc, and probably lose the omeprazole as well. Because in my experience, half of the patients who are taking omeprazole don't really understand why they're taking it. And the other half will agree to a holiday and antacids or some other things. Some people really need those drugs, but a lot of the people in their 70s really don't, in my opinion. So this kind of brings up you know, some of the issues about what else don't we know about the microbiome, what's going in and out, and, and so on. Lots of interesting um, stuff. So coming back to our patient um, who was referred to me, he got FMT, but he relapsed in about two weeks. Um, we, we retreated him, and he was a, a durable success and, and sailed along. Um, and interestingly, um, he'd had hep C's that were positive, several of them, and I thought he was going to, you know, go on to need his hep C treated. Thought he'd gotten it long ago. Um, he was in the right demographic group. And um, interestingly, his hep C totally went away um, when his C. diff was treated. And I had never seen that before. And so I did a little um, search and found this paper, um, which is in the dermatology literature. Patients who were put on any immunosuppressing agent for psoriasis, bad psoriasis. And they followed, uh, this was actually a meta-analysis of multiple studies. And they found uh, three out of 97 people who had a history of hep C reactivated their hep C with um, biological immunosuppression. This is obviously well known for um, hepatitis B, particularly with the rituximab, but I had never appreciated that this could happen with hep C. And I think that's what happened in this patient. He's had multiple negative hep C viral loads, and he never received any immunosuppression. All he got was surgery and the C. diff stress test, which was pretty bad in his case. Um, he lost a lot of weight. He was he was in bad shape, and I don't know. I'm, you know, I certainly don't think anybody else in in ID was familiar with this reactivation. I'd be interested to hear what what GI doctors think about this. The guy is sailing along now. You know, he was looking like the world is ending. I've got cancer. I've got Hep C, and I've got C diff, and he's cured of all of those now. So kind of a nice outcome for him. So this made us um, look uh, at who are the people in our program who've needed multiple um, courses of uh, FMT to achieve a cure. And uh, we're kind of more carefully reviewing these data, but this is just a high level look at it. And essentially what we found is that liver disease and kidney disease or both seem to be um, things that make it much more likely people are going to need to be retreated. So 16 out of 43 um, had liver disease, renal disease, or both. Now, we obviously need to go back and look at the people who are cured with one dose and see what they had. But I think it's my impression that there aren't any people with liver disease in that cohort. Um, the rest of the group. So, so we're trying to, to put this out there. And I now treat 
if I know somebody has cirrhosis, I actually give them 45 capsules or tell them, I think you might relapse, so we're going to watch you closely and bring them back for another 30 capsules in a week because I've seen this happen quite a number of times. Kind of begs the question of what's different about the microbiome and cirrhosis, and this is a fascinating area of research. This is a great paper. Again, I've read it three times. I can barely understand it. Um, but it shows you that there's a hugely different microbiome in um, cirrhotic individuals. So this is um, 50 genes. Each uh, line is a gene. And um, each one of the things is a positive. And so colors display the abundance of the gene. And you can see uh, that the people who are healthy, which are in the left side of these bars, have a totally different microbiome than those in the right side of these bars. And this is shown more graphically here, um, you know, in the principal coordinates plot with the cases versus the controls. Um, these are the community structures, which are markedly different. You can't read any of these names, but um, here in the cirrhotic people, there's a lot of bacteria that we as infectious disease doctors know as endocarditis bugs because they get into the bloodstream from the mouth. And they were able to show this. When you look at the genes, it looks like the oral microbiome has invaded the GI tract of these people, probably because they have such a different bile acid structure and lots of other things. So the mouth is invading the gut here, and it's not a happy thing. Okay. This has also been looked at um, in uh, encephalopathy, obviously a bad complication of liver disease. And again, um, you can see a significant difference here um, in the principal coordinate um, analysis. There's lots of reasons why you could think this might happen. Uh, I love this concept that gut bacteria may produce some GABA-like endogenous benzodiazepines. That's something that's being explored in the psychiatry world um, as well. And then, of course, there's the ammonia connection. Are the bacteria producing ammonia, or are there bacteria that eat up ammonia and um, prevent this in some patients? So this is an interesting thing that this group um, led by Bajaj has carried forward. And up there in the circle, um, you can see that there's a number of different kinds of bacteria that are more likely to be present in um, control healthy people. And there's even one bacterium that was specifically correlated with a bad mental status. Boy, I don't want that one. Um, so uh, they carried this forward into um, a pilot trial to treat hepatic encephalopathy with FMT, recently published. A little bit of an we had a hard time getting this paper. We actually paid for this paper to get it because we couldn't get it in Boston. This is a pilot study. It was men only. Um, meeting age 63, and they had 10 patients that they gave FMT to and 10 who just received whatever standard care was. They pretreated them with amoxipro and metronidazole and then gave a single FMT again by enema, the crappiest route. Again, I'll keep saying it. They picked a donor um, who actually had two of the organisms that I showed you in the last slide present and enriched. It was just kind of a, a flyer. I mean, I don't think there's great data that suggests the, this was a magic donor in any way, but it was a reasonable one to choose. The groups were pretty well matched um, in terms of um, the characteristics. There was a little bit of difference in their baseline white count and um, how many hospitalizations. They did allow rifaximin, and this was um, FDA supervised with open biomes um, material. And these are the results. It was really kind of shockingly good, as many pilot studies are, of course. Um, but standard of care people had um, eight serious adverse events versus two, and zero versus five episodes of hepatic encephalopathy. That's like shocking, uh, shockingly good numbers. But of course, it's not blinded or controlled. Um, they did note some decline in people's mental status with the antibiotic pretreatment. So that's something to think about. And they really didn't find any change in the micro 
microbiome in their initial analysis. Um, I could not understand what they did with Rifaximin, again, despite reading the paper three times. Um, they did have some cognitive testing that was improved, which was, was kind of interesting. So we're thinking about a study in this area um, along with our, our liver group at MGH, and this is what um, my fellow has proposed, um, kind of uh, three to four doses of FMT. I'm not sure this is enough, and I'm probably going to suggest you add at least one or two more doses here. Um, I, I think this will be an interesting study. Um, and again, we're going to do it by the oral route, multiple doses that's is and placebo controlled. So it'll be a much more rigorous study. Some other things that we're doing at MGH, we have a, a study of FMT versus placebo in obesity with metabolic syndrome. We, that's about almost fully enrolled at 19. Um, it's got rigorous metabolic phenotyping using insulin clamps. Um, we have our bone marrow transplant, just restoration. We did not get funded to do that, unfortunately. We submitted a huge grant to look at different doses and different timing after bone marrow transplant. And I do have a, a couple of patients that I've treated for bad uh, microbes. Uh, you know, their gut is just colonized by some horrible thing. And my most recent case looks like a success of a person uh, with salmonella infection with a resistant salmonella bug that it looks like we've been able to uh, so far, Knockwood doesn't kick out. So that's my talk. Um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. My uh, acknowledgments to mostly I need to thank my lab techs who actually deal with the stool and make the capsules, and they should be sainted. Well, I think there are. Um, I haven't been able to document this, but you know, certainly, particularly like in the bone marrow transplant group, you see bacteremias with those nasty bugs, Klebsiella, Morganella, stuff like that. Um, we don't have any numbers yet. We don't have numbers yet, but er again, Eric Pamer's group at MSK is looking at this carefully, and they found a survival benefit coral in people with greater diversity of the microbiome after BMT. Two. You cannot give tons to people who are taking one person. Right? Housing department. True. <laughs> <laughs> in the IBD group, we discussed that you drilled into that group as to whether they were on biologic or neo modulator. I'm sure they did. I don't know the answer to that. Many of them are. You mentioned earlier that you feel that the toxin assay is much better. Oh, it's better. Yeah. Anyway, I misunderstood. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's much more likely that people who are toxin positive yeah. are sick, going to die, right. going to do badly, right. and need treatment. Yeah. yeah. Um, for your say that you're doing on packets of blocked pain, FMT, that's really interesting. A lot of times, the, uh, they just have a refractory. It's a blocked pain. The problem is very, very sick. I'll turn on SPP prophylaxis. Are you excluding? Yeah, we're looking carefully at that, and we started out by looking at how many of our patients are on that, and it's a lot. We are going to try to catch them pretty, we hope, early on in the course, so, so maybe they aren't on that. But, you know, we can't say you can't do that, so we're just going to eat that. It's impossible, and it's just, you know, it's a fact of, of where we are, and, you know, people like me, even though the lab is just down the hall, you know, I have no sway there. You know, our lab actually does the two-step diagnostic test where they look for GDH or toxin and then confirms with PCR if needed, um, and, and you're never going to get these labs to agree. Maybe for some trials you could, could be more um, sensible. Uh, the PCR requires no brain and very limited pipetting skills, so, you know, that's, it's easier, it's faster, and, and it's going to be hard to fight against that. 
I think the approach that many places are taking is trying to um, educate the doctors um, about not sending the test. So there's, again, at IDSA this, this year, there were lots of studies looking at things like hard stops, can't run the test if the computer says the person got any laxatives in the past 24 <coughs> hours, and, you know, making people call the laboratory to get the test and, and stuff like that. So that's the approach that IB is along in anyway. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think people vary over time, and, you know, I don't have one of the best pictures there, which is sort of like uh, a, um, it's hard to describe, they just have sort of these little undulating curves where people um, kind of chuck along over time. Um, I think, you know, there's two different kinds of microbiome analysis, just the 16F stuff versus the full-on, you know, metagenomic shotgun sequencing. And I think when you do do that more expensive, bigger deal, um, I think they are reliable and reproducible. Um, there aren't that many series of really intensive um, analysis of people over time because, as you know, it's hard to get people to bring in stool samples. It's a pain. They don't do it. It sits in their car, you know, at 80 degrees. I, I mean, it, it's, it's actually a challenge to do. Uh, one last question from our Yeah, so there will be a, a product approved, I think, um, Ceres, Rebiotics, uh, Crestovo is a little further behind, but I think there's going to be something in five years. Um, I think there are going to be more uh, FMT studies looking at transferring the whole microbiome. Um, I think the, many people hope that we're going to be going towards these consortia of beneficial microbes, mixtures of things, maybe in the range of, of 10 to 20. I, some of the most interesting conferences I go to are the probiotic um, conferences. And as you know, there's a totally different regulatory structure. If you want to make a probiotic versus drug, and it's a mostly a fascinating economic distinction there. Which avenue do you want to take? Cost up front, you know, marketing, usability. I think it's a fascinating field to be in. Great. Well, we're going to end it there, and uh, thank you very much for...